Hello, welcome back, LGL 130 students. Um, this is a question and answer video. So it will deal with the assigned questions on pages 118, 118, and 119, 119. Hope you're doing very well. It took me a little time to do this on account that um, question five, discussion question five, I should say, kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop, but uh, I think I've sorted it through, and so we'll start with looking at it now. Um, no, not, well, today, I should say. So let's look, uh, question 118, review question number one. Identify the main documents found in the Canada Act that make up the Constitution. Okay, the Canada Act. Well, remember, what is the Canada Act? And it shouldn't be the Constitution Act. Shouldn't it be, you know, it's not any longer the British North America Act. Um, what is the, uh, the Canada Act? Well, remember, as sort of a send-off, the Parliament in Westminster over in London, the United Kingdom, had to pass a law that dispatched Canada from its constitutional purview. So remember, the British North America Act was intended to be a constitution. If you'll recall from our uh, discussion yesterday when we discussed Lord Sankey, and, uh, and the Human Rights Lecture, the Human Rights Code, or sorry, the Edwards case, uh, Edwards and Canada, uh, Lord Sankey talks about that on the slide. He says, you know, it was intended to be a constitution. Well, the Canada Act was the um, last law for Canada passed over in the United Kingdom. Incidentally, a little, uh, little bit of trivia, it was the last um, British law passed in French since the medieval times because, of course, it included um, both official Canadian languages. So what's found in the, uh, the, Const, uh, the Canada Act? Well, let's have a look. Where do we go? We go to page 100. The Constitution Act 1982 retained and consolidated and amended uh, uh, the BNA Act 1867, renamed it the Constitution Act 1867. Most important, the Constitution also include the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter guaranteed certain individual collective rights. So basically, it was the law that said the Canada Act, uh, flipping over to um, page 99, Canada Act en enacted the Constitution Act 1982, the Charter and the BNA, or and the formerly that called the BNA Act 1867, now renamed the Constitution Act 1867, and um, basically did away with the exemption of our Constitution to the Westminster, to Westminster. So, no more constitutional statutes coming from the UK. Of course, we remain a, a common law country. We have a common law fraternity with, um, with England, but uh, England and Wales, which is the legal system that we look to because Scotland has a, a standalone um, different legal system uh, owing to its, uh, its uh, it being a sovereign state up until 1707. But um, yeah, so that, that those are the documents. Let's look, question four, because we didn't do all of them, remember. Why can Canada be viewed as a quasi-federal state as opposed to a federal state? Okay, well, so what is quasi? You know, that like, like, you know, when we're doing these questions, we break down the language. Uh, if there's anything we don't recognize, we sort of look at that, highlight it, and think it through first. What is a quasi-federal state? So quasi uh, means, you know, fake, uh, unreal, um, you know, sort of a charlatan, uh, uh, quasi-federal state. So what would you say about it being, you know, kind of not really a federal state in some way, shape, or form? And uh, if you'll go, um, well, if you'll recall, it's all about, you know, look at the nature of the relationship between the federal and the provincial um, parliaments and legislature. So remember how there are um, a few provisions in the Canadian Constitution that allow for um, disallowance, basically federal government or a lieutenant governor, of course, who is appointed by the by the governor general upon the recommendation of the prime minister, not the premier. So the next lieutenant governor of Ontario 
will be appointed by the Governor General on advice of the Prime Minister, not the Premier. Now, of course, you know that uh, you know that Lieutenant Governor could refuse to royal assent to a um, a bill otherwise passed and gone through all the stages of the legislation um, in Ontario at Queen's Park. It could happen. It uh, hasn't happened for many decades, and I doubt it would. It would be a, a real significant blow to the, the federal nature of our country. But that is what sort of makes it a quasi-federal state. Um, I would just like to find, I know they are in the notes, but I'd, I'd just like to make sure I can find um, the uh, page for you. I'll pause. And I'm back, and I couldn't find it because Exhibit 6.1 and 6.2 was kind of shielding it, but the power of disallowance is found on page 102 and 103, and there's a discussion there about disallowing prevents the Governor General or Lieutenant Governor, both positioned under federal jurisdiction, the power to set aside objectionable laws and so forth. So it's not used um, really, and nor, nor should it be. Um, in my opinion, but again, it's something that is uh, in existence in the Constitution. Okay, let's keep going. Pause again. And I'm back again. Okay. Briefly explain the requirements of the amending formulas. Okay, so um, as you know, as an entrenched statute, uh, you know, or a group of entrenched statutes, the um, amending uh, formulas of the Constitution are there to protect it so that, that this document, this legal, the foundation of our, our country, legally speaking anyway, cannot be changed readily. And that's, you know, and, and the reason for that is because it is deemed that these laws are more important. And, uh, you know, that's realistically how it is. So, um, basically, the formulas can be found on Mending Formula 104, so Sections 38 and 42, the General Amending Formula, Section 41, uh, Amending by Unanimous Consent, so, you know, very, very big changes, including the, um, the the changes to the role of the governor general, lieutenant governors. So basically, I think if Canada wanted to become a republic, uh, sections 40 and 44 and 45, federal and provincial unilateral uh, um, amendments. So the big one is the general amending formula requires that seven provinces that make up at least 50% of the Canadian population agree to a constitutional amendment. Since the population of Ontario and Quebec make up more than 50% of the Canadian Canada's population, at least one of them would have to vote for the amendment to be successful. So in effect, because of the size of our province and our neighboring province uh, uh, down the St. Lawrence River, Quebec, because they are um, the two largest um, jurisdictions, subnational jurisdictions in Canada, they one of them needs to be on board. So. Um, and so yeah, there's the general, uh, the general amending formula and uh, others. Identify the five doctrines. This is um, question six. Identify the five doctrines that can be used where there is real or potential conflict between valid and provincial uh, legislation. So as you know, um, there are, there is some overlap between the provinces uh, passing laws, uh, the, uh, the provincial legislatures, and the the um, Parliament of Canada passing laws. So, what are you know? How do we deal with these, right? Well, number one, the courts have always dealt with this. This has been a big part since the, uh, the British North America Act of 1867 uh, was passed over in London to create the Dominion of Canada, what we now know as as simply Canada. So the, uh, the judiciary has always had an important role as, uh, as the referee. Um, what the judiciary has done over time is developed you know, the five 
doctrines, the colorability doctrine, necessarily incidental doctrine, the double aspect doctrine, paramountcy doctrine, and the interjurisdictional immunity doctrine. So these are them, and then, you know, it would be good for you to know sort of exactly how they are, but we'll talk about that a little further down the line. Um, when will, number question number nine, when will the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity generally be considered? Okay, so um, when do we have it, right? When do we use interjurisdictional um, immunity? So, so what happens there is, um, what happens when there, is, there isn't really an overlap between the laws, but there's something that is very exclusively, per, um, you know, federal. Okay, so, so there is there is some overlap. <coughs> Cough corrected. Um, that the federal parliament is protected, um, but the federal parliament protects it because it is vital and central part of what you found in section 91 of the Constitution Act 1867. So it's a basic, minimal, and unassailable context of a constitutional head of power. So they don't have to touch, but because this issue is so in the middle of a Section 91 or Section 92 head of power, it's so surrounded by its you know, jurisdiction, there is immunity to it. So the Greater Toronto Airports Authority versus Mississauga in 2000, that was a case where Mississauga development fees were, you know, found to be null and void because the Greater Toronto Airports Authority, you know, that federal aviation, aeronautics, is so entrenched in, under Section 91 of the Constitution that it had that interjurisdictional immunity, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of how it works. So from the book here, allows Parliament or legislature to infringe on a head of power belonging to the other, provided that it does not go to the power's core, in order to do so, the infringing portion of the legislation must be shown to be incidental to the overall purpose. And oh, that's sorry, I, was reading. I was reading necessarily incidental. I'm sorry. Check that. I apologize. It didn't make sense, but here we go. Well, while a level of overlap is to be expected in a quasi-federal state, the core of the head of power is protected by the interjurisdictional immunity doctrine. The core may be understood as a vital or essential part and as the, quote, basic, minimal, and unassailable content of a constitutional head of power. To illustrate, Parliament is given authority for federal undertakings under the Constitution. You know, and so that's sort of your airport, okay? That, a federal undertaking is aeronautics, airports. And so that sort of, it has that inter-jurisdictional immunity. Sorry about that. I made a mistake on the um, on the reading the textbook, but you know, my mistake. So, um, may I pull up? All? Let's go. Discussion questions number two. It is 1940, and you wish to appeal your wrongful conviction to the highest court available. Identify the court you would appeal to. Would you be able to appeal to this court today? Support your answer. Okay. So we're 1940. So let's look at, you know, as we do so often in constitutional law, at the history of the Canadian Constitution and the history of the Canadian judicial system. Okay, so I made a little checklist here of dates that we can look at. So what happened um, in the 1830s, 1820s, I believe, the Privy, uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council was found to be um, over in London to be an appellate court. So we had a justice system over there that had a very structured and a very um, developed justice system in the early, uh, in the late 1700s, so 1790s, Ontario um, split off, was cut in half by the government, uh, by the British government, not Ontario, Quebec, excuse me. So uh, we recall the proclamation of 1763. We, uh, we, we recall the Quebec Act of 1774. We recall that all of a sudden, as a result of the Seven Years' War, Quebec became part of the British Empire 
and um, loyalists, refugees from the United States who did not want to join the United States, came up and settled into what is now Ontario. Um, I do, in fact, have ancestors uh, who came across at that time as well. So all of a sudden we got a bunch of English-speaking English you know, settlers in um, what was the wilderness of North America. That, we move forward, becomes English, the core of one part anyway of English-speaking Canada, becomes Ontario, we all, of course, also have Newfoundland, or sorry, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. But, um, yeah, this new country of Canada decides um, to create its own Supreme Court of Canada in 1875. So 1875, we have sort of a Supreme Court of Canada, but still under sort of the British legal system in many respects, that is... In fact, Supreme Court is not supreme because an appeal can be made to uh, the Privy Council over in London. Now, we've talked about this when we talked about criminal law. Criminal, uh, Canadian criminal law and English uh, and Welsh criminal law deviated quite early in the history of the Dominion of Canada because, amongst other things, we developed a criminal code of Canada. So that sort of came along in the late 1800s, and all of a sudden we had a codified uh, criminal statute, which was very important to our development of criminal law. And so we know in the uh, Naden case, we know there were um, attempts by the Canadian Parliament to stop appeals in criminal matters over to the Privy Council. Before the Statute of Westminster of 1931, you'll recall, which basically said, okay, you know, the British wrote a statute, passed a law over at Westminster that said, Canada, if you want to legislate, we won't get in your way. Go nuts, be independent. And so from, you know, and it was, we were independent in 1867. We were, you know, many people, historians will say we became independent during the Second World War when we started to develop our own uh, foreign policy and whatnot. The Statute of, Statute of Westminster basically gave us in many respects um, a de facto legal independence. And so immediately after that, um, the Canadian Parliament passed a law that said appeals for criminal matters will to the Privy Council in London will be stopped. And so we've talked about this case before. British Coal and the King, 1935. Um, I believe it was Lord Sankey again, who basically, uh, it was um, an appeal that, that was brought before the Privy Council where um, a litigant said, no, no, uh, we will contest this law that says no appeals to the Privy Council. So they probably wanted to go um, back uh, to the Privy Council. Lord Sankey said no. They are in effect a, um, a sovereign jurisdiction now and we're not going to interfere. So that's 1935. So let's take us to the question 1940. So we're dealing with a... Um, a wrongful conviction, which is a criminal matter, okay? So, um, and it's not. We're, we're going to do an appeal if, it, if it's not. If it's a civil matter, uh, let's just say it's um, a tort. You know, let's just say we're going to sue um, the, the government for, um, you know, a, 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 in, civil, in civil court for a tort of, uh, you know, sort of a police brutality type of thing. We'll, we'll play that scenario out as well. This, this question went a little longer than I thought it would, but anyway. Um, okay, so can we appeal criminal matters to um, the Supreme Court of Canada? Yes, okay, so we start at the court of first instance. Let's just say um, we, we start at the Superior Court, or as I can't, I can't really remember, the High Court of Ontario. I can't remember what it was named. It's been renamed a few times. Um, I, I can't recall what it was renamed in 1940. But anyway, so we started the Superior Court or the equivalent, the um, equivalent, and then we go uh, all the way up. We go to the Court of Appeal of Ontario. We can keep going, of course, um, you know, and let's say leave uh, for appeal. Um, um, sorry about that. I had to cough. Uh, so let's say, uh, you know, leave for appeal. It's... Um, um, we, it's granted and we get to the Supreme Court of Canada. 
Can we go any further in 1940 for a criminal matter? No, we can't. Okay, that has been uh, that has stopped. That was effective um, in um, uh, 1933. So no criminal matters passed the Supreme Court of Canada uh, from 1933. So we are in 1940. No, it stops at the uh, criminal. Uh, sorry, at the Supreme Court of Canada. But um, let's just say this is sort of a um, a civil matter. This is a civil matter, and um, you know, can that happen? Uh, can we go past the Supreme Court of Canada in a civil matter uh, in 1940? Yes, we can, because um, civil matter, civil appeals to the Privy Council were uh, stopped in um, 1949 in Canada. So, uh, so that's sort of how it works. That went a little longer than I thought. Our last question, question number five. And that is um, the federal, this it took me a little time to get through this. The federal government has enacted legislation that requires banks to return a portion of their annual profits to each customer. Where the bank fails, uh, where, where the bank fails to return a portion, the customer's only stated recourse is to launch a civil action. Can Parliament enact such a law? Identify the two doctrines that would likely be considered by the court and apply them to the circumstances. Which one is more likely to prevail? In this question here, I would, I would really look at sort of the way you answered it, um, because it's, uh, you know, it, it's a tricky question. And that's, and I was thinking, okay, so, you know, let's break it down first. So let's turn, turn back in our books to page 102 and 103. We have Section 91 of the Constitution Act and Section 92 of the Constitution Act, both 1867, of course. And let's just sort of look. So what are we looking at here? Well, first off, we're looking at banking to start with. Requires a bank to return a portion of the annual profits to each customer. Excuse me. So Section 91... Sub 15, banking, incorporation of banks, and the issue of paper money. Okay, banking. So 15, okay. All right. So, can the federal parliament pass laws as it relates to banks? Yes, that's kind of their job. Where the bank fails to return, okay. Um, the legislation requires bank to return a portion of their annual profits to each customer. So what immediately got me going here was, you know, what does that mean to force them to return, you know, a, a dividend to the customer? So right now, you know, I'm a I bank at, you know, one of the big five banks, as most people do. And um, I don't own any shares in the bank, not directly anyway. Um, so... Um, you know, I just, you know, I pay my fees, I get a little interest, and, you know, I, I get a you know, credit card, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, you know, it's not really something that, you know, you know, that would affect me. But I also know that, you know, there is such thing in this country called credit unions. They're very popular in the province of Quebec, for example. And credit unions, um, credit unions are established under the um, section 92. Okay, sorry. Hi, sorry about that. A lot of stops and starts today. I just need to look up credit union. So anyway, so this basically, you know, I don't want to belabor this too much, but, you know, this basically turns these things into uh, credit unions. Um, you know, sort of profit sharing uh, ventures where they're forced, uh, um, you know, where the company uh, through force of law, or the bank through force of law, has to share its profits. So that kind of changes it, and most credit unions are incorporated or regulated. You know, there's federally regulated um, credit unions in Canada, but from my readings of it, most are, um, you know, are uh, regulated by the provinces here. And so that sort of... Um, that's kind of it. So can we do this? Can the um, federal government, uh, parliament, I should say, can parliament enact such a law? I suspect it can. 
um, identify the two doctrines that would likely be considered by the court to apply to them in the circumstances, which is more likely to prevail. So um, let's go through the five doctrines and see what we can see here. So um, what is the pith and substance of this legislation? I'm just following the slides here right now so you can follow along. What's the pith and substance of this legislation? What's it really for? Um, what's it really for? Like it's it's you know it's it's fundamentally changing banking in Canada. Uh, you know it, it's it's basically turning these things from for-profit businesses because generally, if you own shares and most uh, banks you know will give dividends um, because you know they're big companies and they'll, they'll give dividends out to their stockholders. Or the shareholders that's sort of how it works but this sort of fundamentally changes these things into credit unions so um, first step is to determine whether both statute or the statute is valid so um, I think it does fall within the legislative jurisdiction of the Parliament of Canada I think it does um, but you know let's kind of go through the slides a little further um, colorability doctrine is it is triggered where laws enacted with the stated purpose appears to contradict the actual purpose. So remember uh, Morgan Toller, right? Whereas sort of under the auspices of the Medical Services Act, they you know make sure every you know uh, you know that anyone wanting an abortion is has top notch care and has talked to their you know their parents or their spouse or et cetera et cetera. They you know under the guise the auspices of health care. The um, the uh, Medical Services Act realistically touched the criminal matter of abortion, and so that was sort of the colorability doctrine. The court ruled that the purpose of the act was not as stated, and was instead an attempt to legislate criminal matter under the federal head of power, abortion. So, what is the stated purpose of this act? You know, um, profit sharing, uh, push uh, push banks to be less focused on profit and more focused on people, um, that sort of thing. So um, it, it does appear to change, you know, contradict the, the purpose. Um, I don't know. Let's, let's, we'll come back to that. Necessarily incidental doctrine permits some infringement by, uh, infringement by federal or provincial government on a head of power belonging to the other, but only if it does not go to the power's core Fringing part of the legislation must be incidental to the overall purpose, Technica, technicality. Um, the technically invalid part of the legislation is held to be valid because of its close relationship to a larger valid scheme. So the Divorce Act, I'm not really seeing it there. Double aspect doctrine allows for laws to be created by both pro provincial and federal governments in relation to the same subject matter. It's possible for each law to operate without conflict or inconsistency. They will be upheld as double aspect matter. Both laws are a valid exercise of power for each level. You know, Parliament has the power to create federally incorporated companies, but the par uh, provincial legislature has the power to regulate commercial pro uh, commercial activity. Uh, paramountcy doctrine, where there's a conflict and consistency between a provincial and federal, the federal law will prevail. Provincial law will be inoperative. It will go to sleep to the extent that it conflicts with the federal law. The provincial law may remain in force, but if the federal law is later repealed, the provincial law, having been pushed down, will now spring back into place. Um, and then the final one is um, interjurisdictional immunity. So I don't think it's there. So now, okay, so let's, can the federal government um, enact the legislation with, with regard to a bank? Um, and bank shares and whatnot. I think it, you know, it can. I think it's very clearly inter intravirus. Um, so it, do we look at sort of the, you know, the amending constitution and, um, or the amending constitution, I'm sorry. This has gone on a lot longer than I thought it would be. This is going to be one of my longest videos. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I would say maybe the colorability doctrine and that is looking to change um, a credit union. 
I would say necessarily incidental doctrine because we need two here. Um, yeah, I would say that too. I would say colorability and necessarily incidental doctrine. Um, the one would be most likely is colorability doctrine. I do not think it's double aspect because um, you know there isn't really we're not looking at a conflicting um, provincial law. I don't think it's paramountcy. May hmm, possibly. You know what? I'm going to say, and I want you to send me an email if you disagree. Maybe make a comment in the YouTube section. But uh, um, I am going to say that it's colorability, and you know we'll leave it at that. But that's definitely a thinker. So, um, okay, <laughs> 30 minutes. Wow. Um, hope you're doing well. It was a sunny day out today. It's April 1st. No April Fool's jokes for me today. We do not need it. But I wish you all the best, and uh, you'll get a human rights lecture probably later today as well. Have a great day, and um, be well.